Hello, everybody, and welcome again to another edition of the Journal of Lifestyle Medicine podcast. This week, we're going to interview Dr. Dennis J. Courtney. He is one of the pioneers in alternative medicine here in the Pittsburgh area. And by alternative, I do mean all those things that uh, conventional medicine kind of ignores and pays no attention to. And yet, there are some of the most amazing and uh, exciting new technologies uh, that are out there. So how are you doing today, uh, Dr. Courtney? I'm just so fine, uh, Sven, and I'm happy for the opportunity to speak to you on another podcast. We keep doing these. I enjoy doing them a lot. I, I let a lot of feedback from mm -hmm. the people who watch these podcasts. So uh, thank you for the opportunity once again. Yeah, you bet. Your uh, your podcast on the Ozone is actually one of the top three uh, viewed uh, videos that we have on YouTube right now, I think. So you're right up there with some real good company. Uh, Dr. Michael Greger and Dr. Thomas Levy are also uh, big heavy hitters. So congratulations on that. Apparently, a lot of people like this ozone stuff. Um, I encourage everyone to go back and watch that one. But today, we're going to be talking about microcurrents and uh, specifically what uh, microcurrents uh, are doing with the eyes. So uh, let me just refresh everybody that you have a, a nice little article here in our spring issue of the magazine. It's called The Cataract cure. Now, medical science is not really um, too keen on using the word cure too much, but you're pretty confident in that. Is that right? I'm getting more confident with each passing day, but you're so right. Um, when it comes to these eye diseases, I guess the conventional world would claim that they actually have a cure. Their cure consists of a surgery that removes a lens that's so cloudy that it has to be called a cataract lens and people can't see through it and they replace it with an artificial lens right to the extent that that uh, six surgery is successful greater than 90 percent of the time that is their cure for cataracts there's a one would hope however that you should be able to avoid if you wanted to to have such a surgery it's really the area that I've been working with uh, Dr. Edward Kondrat with for a number of years now. We do special eye programs in my office and have done so for quite some time. We um, are about to embark on a brand new uh, way of dealing with cataracts that really has never existed before. And we're hmm. very pleased to present that to those who live in Western Pennsylvania. Well, this is fantastic. Now, Give us just the overview. I know you're using microcurrent, using nutritional therapy, is that right? And also some homeopathy. Uh, give us an overview of all the different kinds of things that you're doing in your in your cataract treatment. Yeah, um, when we've done our eye programs in general, they have been multimodality. And so nutritional IVs, detoxification, certainly frequency-specific microcurrent, has always been a part of each and every program we present. I'd have to say in all honesty, however, that as well as the frequency-specific microcurrent has worked with retinal diseases, it has not come across with an equally um, successful payoff when it comes to cataracts. Hmm. I guess if I were to talk about my batting average up till now, um, when it comes to retinal diseases, 92% correction in three days. Wow. When it comes to cataracts, um, between 40 and 50%. Okay. Now, that 40 to 50% is still a miraculous number, but it's not my number. It's not something I'm happy with. I won't be happy until I get to equivalent and on par with my retinal programs, which, as I say, 92% success rate is a very, very phenomenal but quite pleasant way of dealing with people and vision problems they did not think that they could correct. I would like to be able to offer the same thing when it comes to the cataracts. Mm. And that's why we're embarking on this new cataract clinic that will take place here in my office next week. Okay. Do you want to talk about the clinic a little bit and what all is going to happen there? Well, um, I will say that the motivation for this clinic has been the entrant of a new device, a new field of modalities that will group them together. They're called PEMF. PEMF 
is a sort of another an acronym like FSM was for frequency specific microcurrent. PMF is an acronym for um, pulsed electromagnetic field therapy. Hmm. And as it turns out, when you switch over from frequency specific microcurrent to magnetic fields, the ability for you to impact on cataracts literally goes through the roof. Hmm. So being exposed to some of the more recent devices that have been perfected and seeing how well doctors are doing with just that device alone and uh, the percentage of correction for cataracts is well up into the 60 to 70 percent range. I feel that with a little more tweaking and adding the modalities that we can add to it, we should be able to come in at our 80 to 90 percent range, and uh, I can be, I can be pleasantly happy once again with both retinal diseases and with the cataracts, because cataracts by far are much more common. Mm -hmm. Everybody is going to develop a cataract at some time in their life, hmm. and um, they don't want to have that surgery if they can avoid it. Well, let's. I, I do want to talk more about. The, the procedures and so forth. Um, but let's talk a little bit about cataracts themselves. Um, you write in your article that this is a, a process of aging. I, I never liked that term, uh, process of aging anyway. But uh, you say that, uh, that there's water, uh, there's fluid and proteins in the eye. And over a course of time, these proteins are uh, clumped together. Do we know what causes that? Yeah, I got a feeling that uh, it is the old combination of the three things that have guided me in just about everything that I've treated over the last 20 years. The three things are, number one, various nutritional deficiencies that finally are going to manifest in a problem before we leave this good earth. Mm -hmm. Number two, the accumulation of toxic substances over a lifetime it will also prevent tissue from functioning correctly. And number three, the, lot, the decrease, the lessening of perfusion or blood flow to any given part of the body. Mm -hmm. You put those three pieces of a jigsaw puzzle together, and they explain, they explain more than 90% of the pathophysiology of every disease known to man except the genetic ones. Mm -hmm. Well, that's really, really interesting. Now, uh, so over time, I, I, I understand that the eye tends to collect toxins more than some other organs in the body. Is that true? Well, I think it probably it collects an equal amount of toxins as other parts do. However, because light enters into our world through our eyes, the light itself through exposure of ultraviolet light over a lifetime ultimately damages the lens so that it's sort of like the catalyst factor that takes nutrition and toxicity and, and evolves it into a pathology hmm. that clouds that lens so that it's not clear and, um, and easily emits images anymore. It becomes opaque. The images become cloudy. They become blurry. Uh, lights are viewed as glares. And this is uh, then on a downslope of deterioration of one's healthy vision to a point where really almost total blindness can occur from cataracts that have advanced too far. Yeah. What's, it, what's the average time length, or is there an average time length from when these cataracts start being able to be seen by an eye doctor and total blindness, you know, where you can't see at all. What's that average length of time? Well, thank God it is an evolutionary process. For those that see their eye doctors regularly, it's quite common to um, find the, 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 uh, the, the, the protocol where something like, oh, I identify the beginnings of a cataract in your eye. We will monitor and observe it, and un until such time as it interferes with your vision, um, we will do nothing except monitor it, and then finally I'll recommend that you have a surgery. 
This takes many years for it to evolve. Yeah. Um, others, however, who don't get good medical care or vision care end up having it sprung on them rather abruptly when not having an eye doctor see them regularly ends up putting them in a position where one visit allows an ophthalmologist and optometrist to say, you've got a very large cataract. Your vision is being affected by it. And we recommend that you have a surgery immediately to correct it. Hmm. So it really depends on how well you monitor your own medical care for that to last the, the amount of time, a decade, I guess, would be very safe to say. Okay. Or whether you're going to have a surprise sprung on you at a visit to an eye doctor that you rarely have. But on this particular case, because your vision wasn't working well for you, the doctor told you why it wasn't working well. And more than likely, it was a cataract. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, this is, uh, uh, you know, for someone who's been following this stuff for 25 years now, this is the frustrating part. When I go to my eye doctor and uh, I ask him about nutrition, is there anything I should take or not eat? No, it doesn't matter. Uh, what about toxins? No, it doesn't matter. Um, I asked him, you know, uh, I had a detached retina in November. It happened four days after I had a root canal. I asked him, is there any connection between the, the millions of bacteria that are probably floating around in my head that came out of a two, three inches from my eye, any connection between that and a detached retina? No, no connection whatsoever. I mean, these seems like really uh, common sense things to me. So I, I have to applaud you that you're, you know, direct, you know, dealing with these things directly instead of ignoring them. Uh, the only thing they do mention the traditional doctors is, oh, you have, um, you know, blood flow, blood flow problems, but they don't really give me anything to help address that. So, Let's get on to the, the, the surgery. The surgery is their only answer. <clears throat> there's some problems with the surgery too, right? When you get that lens replaced, there's um, some side effects. Tell us about that. Yeah, I mean, um, they do claim that cataract surgery is one of the safest and most effective surgeries of all, yet it's removing a natural part of you admittedly at the stage it's removed, it's really not working for you anymore. Mm -hmm. You can't see through this opacity on your lens, uh, but you're going to have an artificial lens put in its place. Now, that material is synthetic, and obviously there are potential problems with the use of the synthetic anything when it replaces a natural something. Mm -hmm. uh, in the case of the lenses on the eye, uh, if you're in that rare 10%, that has a problem at the initial insertion, I find that this is a nightmare and patients will tell me the worst thing I ever did in my whole life was to even entertain the idea of a surgery because when I see that a mistake has or a complication has arisen, I never hear how that person is rescued with the next surgery. It seems like it is agonizing from that point on the rest of their life. Mm. But let's take the patient that has a successful surgery. Everything is going well. Their vision appears to be fine. However, what you lack now is that these lenses that are put in your eye do not filter out ultraviolet light as the natural lens did. These, this ultraviolet light then directly comes to be reflected on the retina itself. And the newest research indicates and, I, and the percentages may vary anywhere between 50 on the low side and 70% on the high side of patients with successful eye surgery will develop macular degeneration of the retina within two years of having the successful surgery. And I believe that's a statistic that's not really being repeated enough by the ophthalmologists of this world that the, the complication rate is that high, um, I believe I need to spread that word and I look for the opportunity such as this podcast to get that out there. There are problems even with a successful surgery. Macular degeneration is a retinal disease and there is no correction in the conventional world for it. So on the one hand, you improve your vision. On the other hand, you set a timetable for losses of vision in the future that you won't be able to do a thing about. Wow. So that brings us back full circle again to your 
treatments and your cures, you're saying right now 40 to 50 percent and you're working to get it higher, complete reversal without surgery of cataracts? Uh, I'm saying that uh, in those patients who have a, they use the term, minimal to moderate cataract formation, they're able to have their, uh, their particular um, cataracts reversed successfully greater than 60% of the time right now. Wow. Well, Therefore, I when we add our additional modalities, other than this PEMF device, we're expecting to be able to reach our 80% range. I can't say that we will yet because I haven't done it yet. Mm -hmm. But I'm hoping that uh, within the next month, I'm able to report back to you that mission was accomplished mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that you can expect that kind of a result with cataract uh, treatment and you can avoid that surgery, we think. That, uh, that really, that's really phenomenal. I, I got to tell you, I have been so excited every time the subject comes up and every time I have exposure about all the different microcurrent technologies that are out there. And, uh, you know, I went to Toledo last week and I, and I had a session, well, I had a few hours with uh, Charmaine Bassett Trim, uh, one of the absolute pioneers on the planet with microcurrent technology. This is really amazing stuff. This is, it's mind blowing. And, and you know, we're going to keep talking about this for a lot. So this whole conversation has been how you use a couple of different microcurrents and some other things to treat cataracts, but microcurrent technology, it's exploding. I mean, you're, you're just one of the few people using it for eyes. What are some of the other things that people are using these microcurrent technologies for? Well, it is true that um, uh, because of my uh, relationship with Dr. Ed Condra, an ophthalmologist who literally perfected microcurrent for eye diseases, my focus has been on eye diseases as a uh, pretty, pretty common and um, a frequent diet. But there are microcurrent technicians and clinicians throughout this country working by using microcurrent and PEMF on every body part and every disease known to man. What you're witnessing here, I think, should plainly be uh, uh, shrouded as a paradigm shift. We are moving away yeah. from the pharmaceutical, biochemical drug model of treating disease and we're moving into the quantum realm and I believe it will dominate all medical treatment in the generation to come. Yeah. Medicine is not done well uh, in chronic disease with the pharmaceutical model. Something must change. I believe that the quantum world, the world that explains frequent specific microcurrent and PEMF is going to be where that change occurs, yeah. and I'm excited to be on the cusp of that change. Yeah, I, I have to agree with you there. I mean, uh, you talk about a paradigm shift. Do I like to say the shift is hitting the fan? Because, uh, you know, when the third largest cause of death in America is doctors and hospitals using what they use correctly, you know, that's known side effects. That's just the way things go in the hospitals. Third largest cause of death. Tell us some of the side effects of microcurrent. Are there any? I actually can't tell you any side effects of microcurrent. <laughs> you get healthy. <laughs> um, they're really, except for those cases where microcurrent is either contraindicated or should be used with caution. Things like, um, well, for instance, we never use microcurrent in a pregnant female. Right, right. It just doesn't make good medical sense to do that. We don't use uh, microcurrent or PEMF in people who have uh, pacemakers unless we have discussed the pacemaker with the, the manufacturer, the pacemaker. Mm -hmm. If you have people who have insulin pumps and other pumps, this is another very cautious area of pursuit. I'm not sure. saying you can't move there, but the doctor really must take the care to, to be certain that the device will not be affected because this is current already moving into a device where current already is supplied to the body and it could uh, spell problem. But give or ta uh, taking those few um, specific precautions out of the mix, 
there's no harm to come to you with either FSM or PEMF. There's none. Yeah, that's it, really fantastic. I mean, this is, I think you're right. We are on the cusp of the entire medical system understanding that the human body is an electrical thing as well as a chemical thing and a mechanical thing. And, uh, boy, it's just, it's just so exciting to be uh, talking to you about this. And uh, I so appreciate you being on the podcast to tell us about it. Well, as I say, I enjoy doing these podcasts. I can't tell you um, how, how frequent. I've got phone calls to my office. And I say, how do you ever hear me? You live in New York or you live <laughs> you live in Florida. And it comes back to, hey, I saw you on a podcast. So I, I think the medium is a very helpful one. There are people that really uh, moved and await your next podcast. I'm hoping that I can provide a ray of sunshine and hope through the windows of those who are afflicted with eye diseases. It looks as though because of my relationship with Dr. Kondrat, it's where the bulk of my energy is spent working with eyes. I never would have thought that possible for an anesthesiologist to be an eye specialist now is a circuitous route. I don't even, I don't even want to try to describe how that all happened. Curiouser and curiouser. Huh? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's fun. It's always, uh, it's always a joy talking to you, Dr. Courtney. Uh, I really appreciate you having you on. And uh, what can we, uh, you've got the, your, um, next week you're doing your cataract clinic. What else is on the, the radar here over the next year or over the, over the summer? Um, well, I really feel that uh, if the cataract experiment goes as planned, I'm going to be a very busy doctor because once I can put out a set of numbers that are going to be as, as appealing as I believe they're going to be, my time is going to be spent in treating more eye diseases per month than I ever thought I was going to. So that's number one. Uh, number two, there are conferences uh, coming up uh, that I believe uh, the public should be aware of. One conference is going to be held here in uh, with Microcurrent. We talked about it before we went on air with your podcast. Uh, in October, Dr. Kondrat's putting the ninth Microcurrent conference together. Yeah. There's also an ozone conference in June oh, in right? Utah. These are probably places where I'll show up yeah. uh, and have put my two cents in because I'll be asked. <laughs> well, you are the one of the pioneers, so it's uh, it's always fun to be asked, right? Always fun to be asked. I always enjoy doing these podcasts. Yeah. Thanks for allowing me to come aboard today. You bet. Look forward to a repeat one and asking me, how well did that thing go with the cataracts? Yeah. I'll be waiting to answer that question, Sven. That's great. Well, tell uh, tell people how they can get in, uh, get in touch with you. What's your website? Okay. Uh, website is DennisJCourtney.com? Uh, that's DennisJCourtney.com or okay. the PittsburghEyeProtocol.com for the eye diseases. Okay. PittsburghEyeProtocol.com Pittsburgh eye uh, will be the place to go for all this cataract and uh, – and retinal disease treatment. The other is just all the other things that I do and spent the uh, majority of the last 20 years in doing. Great. Well, we hope to see a, a whole uh, parade of people heading down to McMurray, Pennsylvania to get their eyes fixed over the next few weeks. Thank you so much, Ben. All right. Take care, Dennis.